so good evening students so today is the last session and this is the doubt session as well so if you guys have any doubt related to the last eight assignments you can ask any question from that assignment then we'll discuss that in detail if you do not have any question or any doubt so according to me i'll cover some uh, important topics for the day and for the entire uh, the course so you may proceed if you have any doubt if not then i'll proceed with the important topics and uh, uh, you can if you have any doubt you can drop your message in the chat box
Okay, so let me start with the important question that entire coursework from the last year's assignment. So, like I have listed them and I highlighted some of the important questions that I'll re revise today. So, let me share my screen. So in week one, question number three. Hmm. So here, uh, there's one question stating that uh, to check the packaged milk quality of a particular brand, you put a drop of milk diluted with sterile water in onto a glass light and stain it. So it is then placed under a microscope at 40x magnification. Picture given below. So what could be the best possible prediction for the microorganism mounted on this slide based on its morphology? So here uh, there are some four possible given options here. So the first one is it could be a uh, budding yeast and gram negative bacteria, gram positive bacteria, preferably bacillus. The options is the mixture of gram negative diplococci and gram positive proteobacteria and uh, a mixture of gram positive cocci and a gram negative bacteria so before proceeding further i will just uh, clear what the cocci what monococcus diplococcus streptococcus bacillus spirilla what they are so the first one is cocci bacterial there are some different bacterial shapes so the first one is cocci so so these types of bacteria are unicellular spherical or elliptical shape either they may remain as a single cell or may aggregate together for various configurations so examples of these uh, cocci are monococcus diplococcus streptococcus tetracoccus staphylococcus so you have heard the word staphylococcus a lot of time like example staph s aureus staphylococcus aureus so this uh, in staphylococcus cells divided into three planes forming a structure like bunches or grapes giving an irregular configuration while in bacilli so there are uh, bacilli are uh, road shaped or cylindrical bacteria which either remain singly or in pairs example is uh, bacillus cereus and uh, another types are spirilla spirals are these types of bacteria spiral or spring like with multiple curvature and terminal flagella example one example is there uh, called uh, Pyrillum voltanense. Voltens. Okay. So the next uh, concept in the same is the difference between the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Am, am I audible now? Okay. So the difference between the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So the D, uh, the, uh, sorry, the key distinction between the gram positive and gram negative bacteria lies in the composition of their cell walls a fundamental characteristics identified through through their uh, gram staining techniques like gram positive bacteria possesses a thick peptidoglycan layer as you can see in this picture and their cell walls so which retains the crystal wild stain during the gram staining process so rendering them purple under a microscope so in contrast, gram-negative bacteria have a thinner peptidoglycan layer sandwiched between an outer membrane and an inner membrane, preventing the crystal wall stain from retaining and causing them to appear pink. Okay. And additionally, uh, gram-negative bacteria often exhibit greater resistance to antibiotics due to the presence of the outer membrane, so which serves as an additional barrier. So the, dif the differentiation between gram positive and gram negative bacteria aids in microbial classification and is also crucial for determining appropriate treatment strategies like given the variations in their cell wall structures and susceptibility to different antibiotics okay so there are a lot of uh, staining techniques called steps and primary stain mod modern tree colorizer counter stain it, uh, primary stain will do with the crystal violet all bacteria will be stained bluish or uh, bluish purple you can say and the second step is mordant which is uh, in which grams iodine is used which enhances the crystal violet staining by forming crystal violet 
for iodine complex. So the next one is the decolorizer where alcohol or acetone washes which uh, wa washes away the primary stain from gram negative bacteria. And the last one is counter stain by saffronin or carbol fusion you can say and which counter stain stains the colorless gram negative bacteria. So here we primary stain for one minute then wash with water followed by the luteol uh, iodine for one minute then wash with water then directly wash with alcohol or acetone so counter stain uh, the last step is counter stain for 30 to 60 seconds then wash with water so here as you can see in the first picture so it is a uh, gram positive given purple gram negative given purple and then second step also gram positive both are same like purple purple and both gram negative and positive but in the figure third step gram positive is colorless and gram negative sorry gram positive is purple and gram negative is colorless and in the fourth step it got uh, gram positive got purple one and gram negative got red one and here is one picture as you can see the difference between the gram negative and gram uh, uh, negative bacteria and positive bacteria staining so here gram positive appear violet or purple in color and gram negative bacteria appear pink or red in color Okay. So this is all for the gram negative thing, so uh, bacterial staining thing. So now the next question, the important next important question which I have highlighted is, I'll show you. Question 9 in the first week's assignment. So the uh, question 9th, there are some uh, basic concepts. I'll just cover the concepts only, not question. So the or DNA replication. So here the prokaryotic DNA replication during cell division. So basically the origin of replication, the site where DNA replication initiates exhibits uh, notable differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So in prokaryotes such as bacteria as the circular DNA molecule typically has a single origin of replication. So we can say we can mark that origin of replication is ORIC. Okay. So the initiation of DNA replication in prokaryotes involves the binding of initiator proteins to the origin of replication a region. So uh, leading to the unwinding of the DNA helix and the recruitment of DNA polymerase for the synthesis of new strands. So as you can see here the parent cell DNA was there with having original origin of replication then it has started with the initiator and the next step it got replicated by using the uh, and then called polymerases and we have replication fork here and helicase also then uh, followed by the end of replication which further concluded in the daughter cell DNA and we have two daughter cell DNA after the uh, end of replication so in prokaryotes such as bacteria replication beginners specific site on the circular DNA molecule okay so uh, the initiation initiator proteins including the uh, a series of regulatory events including the assembly of pre replication complexes and the activation of DNA helicases while both prokaryotes and eukaryotes share the fundamental process of DNA replication the differences in genome structures complexity contributes to variation in the initiation mechanisms at the origin of replication. Okay, so here is a diagram stating the same thing which I have covered now. Like we have the three 
the origin then which has the uh, different polymerases and helicases and leading to the replication and ending it we have two primers at the last in, pro, in the eukaryotic protein. So in uh, this is a eukaryote open. I'll cover uh, the entire in brief. So in eukaryote, uh, replication is much more complex and occurs in a highly regulated manner. So the DNA in eukaryotic cells is uh, linear and is packaged into chromatin. There's one thing called chromatin which used to package the DNA in eukaryotic cells. Okay, so which must be unbound and replicated in a coordinated fashion. So replication begins at multiple origins of replication throughout the genome, which are recognized by a complex of proteins called the origin recognition complex. In prokaryotes, it was origin of replication, and in eukaryotes, it's origin rec uh, recognition complex called ORC. So the helicase enzymes unwind the DNA at each origin, and replication proceeds bidirectionally from each origin, as you can see in the diagram, forming replication bubbles. So DNA synthesis on the leading strand is continuous, while the lagging strand is synthesized in short Okazaki fragments. Okay, so here the RNA primers are removed and the fragments are joined by DNA ligase. So the result in a two is uh, sorry the result is two identical linear DNA molecules, each of which is packaged into a chromosome and passed onto daughter cells during cell division. Okay, so this is all for the replication thing. For the both prokaryotic and eukaryotes. So another question which I have uh, marked important as for the basic concept, as in a uh, week uh, three, question number one. Week. Three. Yes. And week three. Uh, this one question one. Stating which of the following statements are incorrect about Sanger's sequencing? Okay. So we have four possible given options here. So DD NTPS terminates growing DNA strand because it lacks the OH group. Synthesis of new strand and starts at 5N and fluorescent detector sensing the color of each fragment tag. And the last option is the DNA templates, primers, polymerase, DNTPs, DDNTPs are required as reagents for performing Sanger sequencing. So let me uh, go into brief what Sanger sequencing is. Just give me a minute. I'm just uh, I'll be back. Hanji. So this is the Sanger sequencing. So uh, basically Sanger methods of gene sequencing is also known as dyed deoxy chain termination method. So it generates nested set of labeled fragments from a template strand of DNA to be sequenced by replicating that template strand and interrupting the replication processes at one of the four bases. So four different reaction mixture are produced that terminates in A, T, G and C respectively. So the principle of this Sanger method is uh, there are like it, I have divided that in five parts. So the first one is our DNA primer is attached by hybridization to the template strand and deoxynucleosides triphosphates are sequentially added to the primer strand by DNA polymerase. And the primary and the primer is designed for the known sequences at third end of the template strand. And the M13 sequences is generally attached to the third end and the primer of this M13 is made. Okay, so as you can see in the diagram, sequences can be read from bands, um, auto radiograph, and original template sequences reduced. So the longest fragment ends with the dideoxy G, and uh, normal G must be at the last base in the sequence. 
okay so this is an important uh, question and important uh, concept for the bioengineering thing so keep this in mind okay and the next important question uh, for the same in the same week is the question number 2 so in question number 2 they have they're saying that uh, wait So the question two is, uh, who technologist wants to compare the gene expression difference of yeast of Kashmir and Kanyakumari? So how should he design the experiment using microarrays? So the possible given options here are, uh, he can extract total RNA from the samples and label and hybridize on the slide. And the next option is, uh, he can extract total DNA from the samples and label and hybridize on the slide. And the question, the option C is he can spot cDNA on the array, extract total RNA from the samples, uh, label and hybridize on the slide. And the option D is he can spot either of DNA or RNA on the slide. So let me go into the brief what he wants to say and what that food technologist wants to design. Hmm. So uh, designing an experiment to compare gene expression differences between a yeast strain from Kashmir and Kanyakumari using microarrays involves careful planning and execution. So microarrays are powerful tools that allow researchers to analyze the expression levels of thousands of genes simultaneously. So here's a step-by-step -step guide on how to the food technologist can design the experiment. Okay. So here the first uh, thing is uh, define objectives and hypotheses. So as it clearly states the goal of experiment, like for example, the food technologist in the question might want to understand how environmental factors influence gene expression in yeast from different geographical locations. Let's which formulate specific hypothesis related to the expected gene expression differences. And the second step is uh, like uh, select the yeast strains. So here, uh, choose a representative yeast strains from both Kashmir and Kanyagumari ensure that these strains are well characterized and have known genetic background. The strains should be cultured under identical conditions to minimize environmental variation. And the third step is sample collection. So uh, the food technologist uh, from the question must collect the yeast samples from both the locations from Kash Kashmir and Kanyakumari. So the samples should be taken under similar growth condition to minimize any confounding factors to harvest cells at a specific growth phase to ensure uniformity. And the next and important part of the uh, process is the cDNA synthesis or you can say DNA, sorry, RNA extraction. So he'll extract the RNA from the yeast samples, which RNA represents the active genes and serves as the basis for a microarray analysis use a reliable RNA extraction method to obtain high quality RNA, okay? And the next is cDNA synthesis and labeling. So the convert the extracted RNA into complementary DNA, which is cDNA, and label it with fluorescent dyes. So typically different type, different dyes are used for two samples being compared. So this labeling allows for the discrimination of gene expression levels between the two samples. And the next, uh, the next step is microarray hybridization. So in this step, hybridize the labeled complementary DNA samples to a microarray site containing probes for thousands of yeast genes. The microarray should include probes for both known and unknown genes. So this step allows for the simultaneous measurement of gene expression levels across the entire genome. Okay? The next is the image acquisition data analysis, validation and interpretation and conclusion. So I'll uh, go to the last step directly now. Interpretation and conclusion. So here we will interpret the, uh, will interpret the results in the context of the experiment's objective, okay? We'll draw the conclusion about the gene expression differences observed between the G strains from Kashmir and Kanyakumari. So discuss the implications of these findings and potential applications in the field of food technology. Okay, and the next question of important question for the same week is question number four. So students keep remembering the 
things which I am covering right now, the basic concepts and topics will help you further. Okay. The next question for the basic concept is the question number four. So here, which of the following enzyme is used to synthesize a complementary DNA library, but not to synthesize a genomic library? So the given options here are uh, restriction enzymes, DNA ligase, uh, reverse transcriptase, and DNA polymerase. So here I'll teach you or I will tell you what cDNA is and how the cDNA cDNA library is formed. Okay, just wait a minute. So uh, a cDNA formation of cDNA library. So a cDNA library is a combination of cloned DNA or a complementary DNA you can say fragments inserted into a collection of host cells which constitute some portion of the transcriptome of the organism and are stored as a library. So complementary DNA is produced from fully transcript mRNA found in the nucleus and therefore contains only the expressed genes of an organism. So similarly, tissue specific cDNA libraries can be produced. So in eukaryotic cells, the mature mRNA is already spliced. Hence the cDNA produced lacks introns and can be readily expressed in the bacterial cells. Okay. So uh, while, informa uh, while information in cDNA libraries is a powerful and useful tool since gene products are easily identified, the uh, libraries lacks information ab about enhancers, introns, and other regulatory elements found in a genomic DNA library. Okay, as you can see in the uh, presented diagram. So, when constructing a cDNA library, the key enzyme used is a reverse transcriptase here. So, a critical enzyme that plays a central role in the conversion of RNA into complementary DNA. So this process is known as a reverse transcription. Reverse transcription. Okay? So in a cDNA library, so the goal is to capture the expressed genes within a particular cell or tissue at a specific point in a specific point in a time. Okay? So since mRNA, which is messenger DNA, messenger RNA, serves as a direct transcript of the actively expressed gene. Reverse transcriptase is utilized to synthesize the corresponding cDNA from the mRNA template and which I have uh, heard, talked about the important gene in the formation of cDNA library is reverse transcriptase. So I will just tell what is reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase is actually uh, valuable in the context because it helps researchers study the actively transcript genes providing insights into gene expression patterns, variation and regulation. So the resulting cDNA library represents a snapshot of the genes that are actively producing mRNA in the studied biological sample. On the other hand, so when synthesizing a genomic library, which aims to represent the entire genomic content of an organism, reverse transcriptase is not employed. So genomic library encompasses the entire DNA content including coding and non-coding regions, introns and intergenic regions. Okay. So back to the question. So here the anyone would like to answer this question after this the entire theory and the basic concept class. So which uh, enzyme is used to synthesize its cDNA library but not synthesize genomic library. Anyone? It is a bit simple. I was talking about from last time. Because transcriptase. Exactly. Reverse transcriptase. The option C. Okay. And then uh, moving to the next important question for the same uh, week is the question number 8. Question.
so here in question number 8 uh, rohan has purified a recombinant protein so he wants to check its molecular weight so which of the following methods he could use to check the uh, molecular weight so the options given here are uh, sds page electrophoresis mass spectrometry analytical size exclusion chromatography or all of the above mentioned techniques can be used so according to the question here so rohan is having a purified recombinant protein which he can employ various methods to determine its molecular weight so accurately by the way so one widely used technique is sds page so i'll cover all the methods one by one sds page mass analytical size everything so the first thing is sds page electrophoresis so here in sds page so the protein is denatured and coated with uh, uh, sorry uh, sds page let me uh, explain what sds page is the full form of sds page so the full form is of sds is uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis so here in uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis with sds or uh, it is a detergent that imparts a uniform negative charge to the protein molecules which effectively eliminating the influence of protein shape and allowing for size based separation during electrophoresis as you can see in this diagram so here the separated proteins can then be visualized using staining methods and their molecular weights estimated by comparing their migration distances to that of a non molecular marker molecular weight marker so additionally a uh, gel filtration chromatography also known as a size exclusion chromatography this method was given in the option i am covering that also uh, that this is the size exclusion chromatography here this can be included also uh, this can be employed also but this technique separates proteins based on their size as they pass through a gel matrix with the larger proteins eluting earlier than smaller ones the elution profile can be then used to estimate the molecular weight of the purified protein and the next given option here is mass spectrometry or we can say molt so this method involves ionizing the protein molecules and measuring their mass to charge ratio providing highly accurate information on the molecular weight so molt there is one thing molt m a l d i so this is a matrix assisted laser desorption or ionization technique or you can uh, the lemon is uh, electrospray ionization are common techniques used in the mass spectrometry for protein analysis okay so i'll cover this the sds one first so now anyone would like to answer this question i have told the everything so here the right answer for the question it is the all the above mentioned techniques can be used as i have told that all the uh, mentioned methods can be used to check the molecular weight of whatever the rohan has purified what is the whatever the rohan has uh, purified a recombinant protein okay so the next important question according to me from the next week week 4 question number 10 Sorry, not from this one. Wait, I have to get one. Wait, I'll. A uh, week five question number two. Sorry, yeah. Week five question number. Week five. Question number two. Like suppose you are screening for an antibiotic. which works by inhibiting peptidoglycan of a cell wall so you take two bacterial strains also this question same question and the basic concept i have covered earlier also in the weeks one 
what is it? Cover one second. So there is one thing, a human genome project in the same week, question number seven. This I have covered in the weeks one, okay? So we'll go with the human genome project, question number seven. So this question number seven. So here, as you can see, uh, let's assume a bacterial cell wall cell, which is initially growing and replicating in 14N, which is a light band containing media, is transferred to 15N. Okay. So uh, containing uh, 15N containing media, what would be the composition of DNA of bacterium after two generation in 15N medium? So anyone would like to answer this question? This is a very easy question, by the way. Not then I will proceed further with the explanation. Krishna, your uh, mic is on, on mute. And you need to mic out. Okay. We have missed some of the questions and the important ones. Just give me a minute.
हाँ जी तो हियर इन दी क्वेश्चन सेवन तो लेट मी टेक दिस इन एरियो इन विच वी आर डिस्क्राइबिंग एंड विच इन्वॉल्व यूज ऑफ एन आइसोटॉपिक लेबलिंग ट्रेस डी एन ए वेयर इट इज रेप्लीकेशन इन बैक्टीरियल सेल लेट मी ब्रेक डाउन द प्रोसेस फॉर यू तो लाइक इनिशियली द बैक्टीरियल सेल इज ड्रॉइंग एंड रेप्लीकेटिंग इट्स डी एन ए इन अ मीडियम so we have uh, in, there are two types of things called conservative and the semi conservative replication so if a dna replication so conservative the original 14n which is the labeled one uh, labeled dna strands which would remain together and the heavily newly synthesized 15n labeled strands would uh, form a separate set okay so in this case you would have two distinct population of dna with one only 14n another with the 15n so okay so the moving next thing is what can questions from the week 6 is the question number 1 yeah this one so the question one from the week 6 is asking so dna get compressed with into a smaller volume inside the nucleus finally forming the nucleosome structure so the nucleosome is the fundamental subunit of chromatin Select the correct statement about the nucleosome. So here, four one images given here, and the four given possible options are given here. So certainly, let's delve into the intricacies of DNA packaging within the cell nucleus. So here, DNA is a long double-stranded molecule that carries. the genetic information in the form of a sequence of a nucleotide bases so the first level of uh, compaction involves the winding of dna around histone proteins to form nucleosomes like histones are positively charged proteins that attract the negatively charged dna due to its phosphate backbone a nucleosome consists of a core particle where dna wraps around a histone octamer and a linker dna segment connecting adjacent nucleosomes so the histone octamer is composed of two copies each of four core histone proteins called h2 a h2 b h3 and h4 so here the nucleosome structure serves several important purposes firstly it provides a stable and organized arrangement for the genetic material preventing dna from becoming tangled and facilitating its compaction secondly wait i'll show the figure also so secondly nucleosomes play a key role in the regulation of gene expression accessibility of dna to cellular machinery such as transcription factors and rna polymerases is influenced by the positioning and modification of nucleosome along the dna strand and here the term chromatin you can uh, get one term chromatin so chromatin refers to the complex of dna and proteins including nucleosomes that makes up the genetic material within the nucleus so chromatin undergoes dynamic changes during various cellular processes such as dna replication transcription and its repair the nucleosome serves as a fundamental subunit of chromatin and its structure and organization are crucial for the proper functioning of the cell so in summary of the entire nucleosome model chromosome so the compaction of dna into nucleosome is a fundamental process that allows the is efficient storage and regulation of genetic information within the confines of the cell nucleus and the nucleosome structure with its histone dna complex is a cornerstone of chromatin organization and contributes to the intricate control of the cellular activities okay so the next uh, important question according to me is question number 4 from the team b here some steps and stages are given below so let me read the question for you so here the graphics below depicts the sequences of events that occur throughout the development of an embryo select the appropriate answer for 1 2 3 and 4 from the below mentioned options so here the random given options they were are fertilization blastula gastrulation and organogenesis so we'll cover the entire thing this is the most important uh, question for this week that so 
the development of an embryo is a complex and highly orthotic processes that involves a series of carefully regulated events so here is a broad overview of the key stages and events that occur during embryonic development so we'll start with the day 1 and the step 1 that is fertilization so the process begins with the fusion of a sperm cell and a egg cell that is two sites during fertilization so this forms a zygote the first cell to the new organism with a complete set of chromosomes the second one is cleavage so the zygote undergoes a series of rapid cell division through a process called cleavage so the cleavage divisions result in the formation of a blastula a hollow ball of cells and the next is gastrulation so the blastula undergoes gastrulation a critical process that establishes the prime the three primary germ layer called ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm so the gastrula is formed which has distinct layer of cells with specific developmental potential and organogenesis is during organogenesis the germ layer give rise to specific organs and tissues so various signaling molecules and genetic programs guide the differentiation of cells into specialized cell types and the next is somite formation so in somite formation the mesodermal layer somites are formed so which gives rise to structures such as muscles bones and the vertebral column and the next step is uh, the placenta development or placental development so in mammals so the placenta develops facilitating nutrient and gas exchange between the embryo and the mother so the placenta also produces hormones crucial for maintaining pregnancy so the next is the fetal development so the embryo now referred to as a fetus undergoes further growth and maturation so organs continue to develop and differentiate the structures such as limbs tissues and internal organs become more defined and the next and the last step is parturition that is called birth so the process culminates in parturition or birth where the fully developed fetus is expelled from the mother's uterus and takes its first breath so in some species so additional stages such as the transition from aquatic stage to life in amphibians or hatching of eggs in birds occur okay so throughout these all stages so the development of an embryo is are uh, regulated by genetic programs signaling pathways and some of the environmental factors so any disruption is the in the so any disruption in the highly or tightly controlled process can lead to developmental abnormalities so the study of embryonic development is fundamental to understanding the principles of biology and has significant implication for fields such as medicine and genetics okay so moving to the next uh, question yeah this one the convergent and the parallel evolution so question number 8 so here uh, the one image is given below so the graphics below depicts two very distinct forms of evolution so correctly identify them using the right logic so some options are given here the divergent evolution and the convergent evolution so uh, as you can see the divergent evolution and convergent evolution one uh, difference between both the evolution are given below so in divergent uh, evolution divergent evolution is the process by which the related species become less similar in order to survive and adapt in different environmental condition whereas in convergent the process by which unrelated species become more similar in order to survive and adapt in similar environmental condition and in divergent so the same structure evolves in different directions as you can see in the diagram also uh involves in different directions in different organisms while meanwhile in convergent different structures evolve in the same direction in different organisms For example, so the divergent is for limbs of whales, bats, cheetah, and humans perform different functions. And the 
perfect example for convergent evolution is wings of butterfly and of birds and potato and sweet potato as you can see okay so moving to the next some of the important concept we get So week eight question number one. This one thing called fluorescence in situ hybridization. So the question number one uh, here. So let me explain what fish is fluorescent in situ hybridization. So basically, this fish uh, is a technique used to detect and localize the presence or absence of specific DNA sequences on chromosomes. So in the context of cervical cancer, fish can be utilized. to detect genetic abnormalities such as amplifications or deletions of specific genes associated with the development of cervical cancer so this technique provides valuable information about genetic alterations that may contribute to the risk of cervical cancer as you can see in the diagram so the screening the serum samples using protein microarrays for autom antibodies so protein the next diagram it is protein microarrays so here uh, protein microarrays are powerful tools for analyzing the expression levels of multiple proteins simultaneously so by screening serum samples for uh, auto antibodies so which are antibodies produced by the immune system against body's own proteins we can identify potential biomarkers associated with cervical cancer elevated levels of specific auto antibodies may indicate an immune response against protein that are dysregulated in cervical cancer cells okay and the next thing which i want to explain here is some uh, things about the mass spectrometer the question when this is the last question for the according to me the important one okay i'll cover the one by one So here the diagram describes a type of ionization source in mass spectrometry. Pick the correct statement. So here the statements are the diagram illustrates electrostatic ionization, where the analyte is a ga gaseous chemical, and in the illustration of chemical ionization, the analyte is a volatile material. And the option C is the process of thermostatic ionization, which is shown in the diagram, in which heated particles bombarded the solvent and cause it to ionize. And the option D is the diagram illustrates the Molde principle, which calls for uniformly mixing samples with a substantial amount of matter. So here, let me cover the Molde things. The so Molde is an ionization technique that uses a uh, laser energy-absorbing matrix to create its own ions from large molecules with minimal fragmentation. So it has been applied to the analysis of biomolecules such as uh, DNA, proteins, peptides. And carbohydrates. Okay. So the both the things in in the Molde methodology. Uh, Molde methodology has three step process. First, the sample is mixed with a suitable matrix material and applied to a metal plate. Second, a pulsed layer irradiates the sample, triggering ablation and desorption of the sample and matrix material. Finally, the analyte molecules are ionized by being protonated or deprotonated. in the hot pulse of ablated gases and then they can be accelerated into whichever mass spectrometer is used to analyze them okay and in the next question there are some basic concept terms are there so i'll cover i'll not uh, go to the options and the question thing i'll just cover the terms given here in the question so the term given here is one is electrostatic ionization So I'll cover one by one. Okay. So the one is electrostatic ionization. So it is a technique used in uh, mass spectrometry to produce ions using an electrospray in which a high voltage is applied to a liquid to create an aerosol. It is especially useful in producing ions from macromolecules because it overcomes the propensity of these molecules to fragment when ionized. So the next is the gas phase ionization. So gas phase ionization refers to the process of converting neutral gas molecules or atoms into ions by gaining or losing electrons so this phenomenon commonly occurs in environments where gases are present such as earth atmosphere or in laboratory conditions 
within a vacuum chamber. So here it has some different things for electron impact ionization, chemical ionization, photo ionization. So the next uh, term is uh, solution phase ionization. So solution phase ionization occurs in liquid solution. Okay. So where neutral molecules or compounds undergo ionization to form ions. So this process is crucial in various chemical and biochemical reactions occurring in aqueous solution. So solution phase ionization commonly involves the dissolution of a substance in a solvent where it can either donate or accept protons to form cations or anions respectively. Okay. And the last uh, term here is uh, solid phase ionization. So solid phase ionization involves generation of ions within solid material. Okay. So this phenomenon is observed in various contexts including semiconductor physics material science and analytical chemistry. So in semiconductor devices such as transistors and diodes, solid state ionization occurs when impurities or dopants introduce additional charges carries into the crystal lattice thereby altering its electrical conductivity. And solid state ionization can also occur through processes like thermal ionization where high temperatures cause the emission of charged particles from solid and radiation induced ionization where ionizing radiation interacts with solid materials to produce ions. So in summary of this all these uh, terms given here, so gas phase, solution phase, solid phase ionization represent, represent distinct processes by which neutral species are converted into ions in different physical states. So each playing critical roles in various scientific disciplines and technological application. Okay, so this all for the this bioengineering course. So that's all for today. So now you guys can uh, leave the session and good luck for exams at the FPTL course. Okay. So you guys can uh, the session. Thank you.